Hi everyone, welcome to New Vine Online. It's so great to be meeting together again with you. If you're visiting with us today, special welcome to you. We're really thrilled that you've chosen to tune in and join us as we spend this time turning our attention and focus to uh, our wonderful God. Uh, I'm Paul. I'm Abigail. And we're going to be hosting our service today and it's a thrill for us to be able to do so. Abs, did you know today is week 22 of New Vine Online? Can you believe it? That has gone quick. Well, also gone slow in yes. a lot of ways. <laughs> it has gone quick, but in other ways it's been an absolute drag and a mission. Mm. What is it that you've missed most about meeting together here in person? Hugs, definitely. I think that's a surprise to no one. I'm still getting lots at home. <laughs> uh, also, worshipping together. That's probably that's the biggest thing that yeah. I've been missing, being together, feeling the presence of God together, and it being a, a group activity almost. I'm, I'm missing that, yes. definitely. Yeah, that is a huge part of what we do when we meet together. And unfortunately, we're still not able to do that, but we can mm. still worship in this format. Mm. And we're going to do that right now. Thanks to our wonderful musos. We really appreciate you guys. Yeah. We're going to sing a song now, uh, King of Glory, where we really do focus our attention on uh, this wonderful God that we serve. A God who doesn't necessarily spare us from life's trials and hardships, but a God who promises to be with us in the midst of them and give us his strength. Let's worship him together.
Thanks again to our musos for that great time of worship. Mm. Hey, I'd really like to just lead us in a prayer in response to that song. Maybe for some of us this morning, you identified with that need for God to prove himself strong and mighty. Maybe you're going through a tough time right now in your life. And uh, I'd like to just pray and invite God into those situations. So if that's you, make this prayer your prayer today. Father, we thank you for who you are to us. And Lord, as we gather together today, we do so because you have first called us to yourself. And we thank you for your love, for your grace, for your faithfulness toward us. Lord, we acknowledge that at times this life does uh, take us through some difficult situations. And you don't always spare us those. But we thank you that you are with us. And Lord, we pray and ask today that you would prove yourself strong. Prove yourself mighty. Lord, today, for those of us who are standing before you or maybe sitting but owning this prayer, Lord, Come into the midst of that situation that we're eyeballing. Lord, we need your strength. We need your help. We need you to lead us through it. So, Lord, today we welcome you, Lord, with faith and hope. We look to you, daring to believe, Lord, that you would give us the strength that we need to uh, not just persevere, but, Lord, to dare to believe that we can, with your help, overcome. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Speaking of prayer. Yes on your screen the live prayer button have you clicked it yet why not <laughs> we think prayer is so important yes please jump on there it's a live prayer button you can click it during worship during the sermon at any point today you can hop on there and you can pray with someone there is also a button for giving on the screen click on that too <laughs> we've got online on our newvineonline.com what you're on now we have also got a button for life groups. If you're not involved, 22 weeks is a long time. It's nearly six it's months. Time. Please get involved in one. It's going to benefit you. It's going to benefit other people. We've got groups on Facebook as well. You can jump on there. You can see what is around you, what's closest for you to get to, what group your friends are in. Just get in one. Mm -hmm. Just get in one, meet together. There are a few other ways that we're meeting together at the moment as well. There are, yeah. If you really just want to get together with some people, uh, person on person, then mm -hmm. uh, there are some opportunities for you to do that. Uh, one of those is uh, our Sunday mornings, actually, uh, for young families, so with maybe primary age kids. Meeting here Sunday mornings, the kids are off in their kids' programs, an opportunity for the adults to uh, connect, to watch our online service here on the big screen and uh, enjoy some fellowship around that. Uh, there's also an opportunity at the second and the fourth Monday night of every month at 7.30 mm. here at the church. Uh, it's called Presence and it's an opportunity for you again to be meeting with others, but more importantly, meeting with God, entering into his presence together through prayer and uh, reflection upon his word and, and uh, music. So if that's something that interests you, tomorrow night, uh, 7.30 <laughs> here, come along. Uh, but a third way uh, for you to meet together in person, perhaps, uh, is to visit our church plant out at Beaches. We've been meeting back together now for a couple of months, so we would, we would love some visitors. We'd mm. love you to come pop in, say hello. So if that interests you, 3 p.m. Sundays at Dudley Primary School, we, we'd love to have you come there and uh, look forward to your visit. But uh, we're going to maybe pray for our network. Mm. Uh, I'm going to do that right now. Uh, that God will continue to guide us and lead us through this season. Father, we thank you for our church here, for each person that calls it home. Uh, Lord, they, you love them, we love them. And Lord, we do look forward to being able to meet back together in person at some stage. We hope it's not too far down the track. But Lord, in the meantime, we pray and ask that you continue to give us wisdom. Lord, not just here at Maryland, but across our network. We pray for the pastors and leaders. Lord, give them wisdom and discernment as they endeavor to lead their congregations forward during this time. Lord, what we pray for ourselves, we pray for your church right across this city and nation and world. Lord, in this uh, uncertain time, uh, Lord, where people are needing hope and security and reassurance, mm -hmm. Lord, as your churches, Lord, help us to be that place where people can find hope. More importantly, Lord, may we be uh, those people who point them toward you, the one who can provide the ultimate and lasting hope and assurance that each one of us are looking for. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Morning, New Vine. Welcome to my place. Thanks for joining me this morning. I thought we'd have uh, communion together. I'm uh, Charlie, if you don't know me. Um, I work at the university as a learning designer. And when I 
look at communion as a, as a learning exercise, if you like, Jesus being a teacher, um, it's an amazing piece of learning design when you think about it. Um, I mean, it works great as a, as a group activity. Um, it's very short, very easy to remember, and it uses concrete materials to illustrate a concept. What I really like about it, though, is that it shifts focus away from little issues onto fundamental truths, and it facilitates meaningful reflection. If you haven't got wine and bread, that's okay. You can use anything you like, really. Um, and if you don't have anything that resembles food and drink, then maybe it's time to go grocery shopping. But um, it'd be great if you could uh, join me today um, and share communion and think about how it is that Jesus, as the, the way, the truth, and the life, how, how that's affecting your journey at the moment and what, what that's doing in your life. Um, we all live very busy lives and so this, this way of reflecting, this, this um, metaphor of joining Jesus and taking part in his way, in his truth, in his life, um, is a really important thing to do regularly. So uh, join me now if, as we pray. Lord, we thank you that you have provided a way uh, for us to be in close relationship with you. That uh, your way, your truth and your life is what keeps us steered in the right direction. And Lord, I just pray that you would examine our hearts, that you would uh, get into our thoughts and show us what things that we need to change to, to be more on track with you. Um, please deal with any unforgiveness that we have, any hurts that we have, anything that's going to divert us away from your characteristics. And Lord, I pray that uh, today and this week, Lord, you would keep showing us ways to not just walk your path, but show your path to others. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thanks guys, have an awesome morning and we'll hopefully catch up soon.
G'day, I'm David, and today we are continuing our series, Jesus Is, where we're looking at the I Am statements of Jesus from the book of John. If you were with us last week, you'll have seen Luke bring a cracking message on I Am, the resurrection and the life, where he looked at uh, the resurrection of Lazarus and the characters involved in that story. If you missed it, but not to worry, you can jump on our YouTube channel or onto New Vine Online and watch that sermon on catch up and you will be blessed if you do. So I want to begin today by asking you a question. Have you ever felt overwhelmed? Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you've been presented with news or information that has just completely flummoxed you and you've got no idea how you're going to move forward or find any kind of path or direction out of that situation. Perhaps for you, your story was that you received an unwelcome diagnosis from your doctor. Maybe it was the loss of a close friend or family member. Perhaps you were taken into the boss's office and they have a conversation with you about having to downsize and they're having to let you go and you don't know where your next paycheck is coming from. Maybe it's spiraling debt and you have no way out. Maybe it's coronavirus. Maybe the whole COVID-19 situation has really overwhelmed you. I've felt overwhelmed at times in life. I, I remember without fond memory of training as an air traffic controller one Scottish winter's day and becoming overwhelmed by the situation unfolding in front of me. 
fortunately I had somebody who was very experienced behind me was able to step in and take control and everybody got home that day. Not nice feeling overwhelmed though is it and I wonder if, when you think back to that time that you were how you felt how hopeless or lost you may have felt in that situation. Well if you've ever been overwhelmed you're in a good position to understand a bit of the background with what's going on with today's scripture. And we're looking at John chapter 14, but we have John chapter 13 to 17, which is this very long discourse uh, with Jesus and the disciples. And there's this great uh, scene unfolding. The disciples and Jesus are gathered in the upper room to celebrate Passover. Passover, this great event where, where God has saved uh, the nation of Israel out of slavery and bondage in Egypt, eventually bringing them into the promised land. And it's a feast that is commemorated every year by the Jews. So it's a time of reflection, but it's also a great time of celebration. And these 12 plus Jesus are in this room and the 12 have no idea what is about to unfold for them. For them, it's another Passover, something they would look forward to. But Jesus is gonna drop a few bombshells in their evening. Now, I love the fact that the disciples give us this rich picture about what's going on. You know, when we think back to when Jesus actually called them, they're busy at work. You know, we see some of them in the fishing boats, tax collectors. Jesus comes along to them in their place of work and says, effectively, drop everything and come and follow me. And without hesitation, they do. They leave behind their employment. They leave behind businesses that they're partners in. They even leave behind family members. They give it all away to follow Jesus. And I find it interesting, that whole thing, you know, imagine being at work on Monday. Monday morning, you're working away, doing whatever work it is you do, and someone comes along to you and says, leave everything and come follow me. How you would view that, what your response would be. I'm fairly certain I wouldn't be rushing off and, uh, and following someone that I didn't know. But there was obviously something about this Jesus that drew them to him, that made them feel some strength in giving up what they had to follow him. So for a period of about three and a half years, the disciples are with Jesus in his earthly ministry. And in that time, they have seen incredible miracles, signs, and wonders. Jesus has healed thousands upon thousands of people. Everyone that we're aware of that were brought to him, he healed. They have seen him cast out a multitude of demons from demon-possessed people. They have seen him cleanse a leper, something that's hardly ever been seen ever. And they've witnessed him at, on at least three occasions ruin a funeral where he has brought somebody who was dead back to life. They've watched this man feed anywhere between five and 15,000 people, men, women, and children, with five barley loaves and two fish, with 12 baskets of leftovers at the end of it. They've seen him calm a storm on the sea. They have seen him walk on water, do all of these incredible things. The disciples themselves have gone out in twos ahead of Jesus and have done some of these things at their own hands. So all of this has been going on. They have sold up everything effectively. They have nailed their colors to the mast for Jesus and they are all in for him. They've left it all and followed him. And tonight, we're, but we do also see that there's this dynamic going on and we have the benefit of the New Testament to actually look and see what's going on there. There are occasions where they really don't understand what Jesus is doing, what his purpose and mission is. You know, we, they believe that Jesus is coming to overthrow the Romans, restore Israel to this place of political power, that Jesus will rule and reign and they will be his inner circle, his uh, right-hand men. They don't understand that he's actually come to be the suffering servant. And so they're looking at worldly things. Jesus is looking at heavenly things, spiritual things. We do see a little snippet where Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But it's apparent from the New Testament gospels particularly that they didn't really understand who he was. But anyway, they're in this upper room setting and Jesus has just, you know, the, the, the meal is prepared and Jesus has washed their feet. And then it tells, tells us that he becomes troubled. And he begins to drop the first of three bombshells on the disciples. The first one is that one of them is going to betray Jesus. 
Now, we can tell from the scripture this causes consternation because not one of them know who it is. They don't know which one of the disciples is going to betray him. So they're asking others to ask Jesus, who is it? Jesus actually does tell them who it is. He says, you know, this morsel, when I dip it, I will and give it to the one. They are the one who will betray me. And then he dips and gives the morsel to Judas Iscariot, saying to him, what you must do, do quickly. And out he goes. He's just told them he's going to dip and give it to the person. But even then, they still don't know. They think that he sent Judas out to get some things that they need for the meal. So they're still uncertain who it is. He then drops the second bombshell. These 11 that are left who have followed him for three and a half years, he tells them, I'm going. And where I'm going, you can't follow me. More shock and consternation for them. We then see Peter protesting with them, saying, why can't we follow you? And Jesus says, where I go, you can't come now, but you'll come later. And Peter presses and insists again, saying, why can't I follow you now? And then we get the third bombshell, that in fact, Peter, who now says, I will lay down my life for you, will in fact, before the night is over, deny his Lord three times. So there's an awful lot going on in this dynamic. So if you've ever felt overwhelmed, you can probably have some sense of identification with what these uh, remaining 11 disciples are feeling right about this time. So we're going to jump in now to uh, John chapter 14, reading the first six verses. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything's ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. No, we don't, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. I love the disciples. We wouldn't be here if they hadn't followed through with Jesus' commandments. The gospel would not have spread. But they ask all of these interesting questions and they ask those kind of questions that I would probably ask and feel foolish about asking. But Jesus has just turned their world upside down. They've been completely rocked by these three revelations that we, we discover in John 13 and then gives them these words of comfort at the beginning of John uh, chapter 14. You know, we read that line there, Thomas says, no, we don't, Lord. We have no idea where you're going. How can we know the way? And we, we tend to read it like that, but I imagine a very, a very frustrated and very um, heightened Thomas saying, we've no idea where you're going. How can we know how to follow you? Now that statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. It's not a difficult passage for us to understand. It can be a difficult passage for some to accept, however. It's one of the most audacious statements that Jesus makes about himself. And he made a few. And whenever we see him use those I am statements, it's a throwback to God revealing his name to Moses in the burning bush out in the desert. Now, the fact that he says that there is only one way to God and that Jesus is the way now that's not sitting well with everyone. It's certainly not sitting well with the Pharisees and even today it doesn't sit well with a lot of people. We live in a world that is rapidly changing. Social and political movements are springing sweeping changes across the globe with unprecedented speed. The general public are starting to speak out about things that they will no longer tolerate and some of those are very good things. How, though, does that impact you and me, members of the body of Christ? How ready are we to take a stand for our faith in acknowledging that there is one God and that the only way to get to him is through Jesus, his son? On the face of it, that is an incredibly exclusive claim. Some might say that's a bigoted statement to make, saying that we are right and you are wrong does not go down well in our society today. Does that give us cause to have a spirit of fear? Perhaps we should bite our tongue. 
go with the flow in order to live at peace with the world around us. I've just returned uh, from a few weeks away on holiday. Perhaps you can see how relaxed I feel right now. And in my devotional time, I've been camped out in the Gospel of Mark. And I feel like I've been reading it with uh, fresh eyes. And I have been overwhelmed whilst reading those verses and chapters. I've been overwhelmed by the sheer power of the Gospel. Rather than being something that we should be fearful of, when it is presented correctly, in love, the gospel is irresistible. Jesus, yes, he was Jesus, but he had no problem in attracting thousands and thousands of people to his message. They hang on his words, they hang on his teaching. People were hungry to hear the words that give life from the word that gives eternal life. When the gospel is presented in love, it touches the deepest, innermost, heartfelt needs of an individual in a way that transforms us from death to life. Each one of us who professes faith in Jesus Christ can testify to that fact. So, Let's zone in on this audacious statement that Jesus is making here. I am the way. In a world that feels increasingly lost, where the moral bar and spiritual awareness seem to be dropping and fading with gathering pace, where people are desperate for direction, for meaning for life, for affirmation, Jesus is the way to the kingdom of God. It's a kingdom of light, a kingdom where there is no lack. And that kingdom is available to us today, here and now. Earlier in John's Gospel, chapter 10, he makes another I am statement. I am the good shepherd. In verse 7 of that chapter, Jesus says of himself, I am the gate for the sheep. And in verse 9, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. Jesus isn't sitting on a hedge or a fence here. He is unequivocal. He and he only is the way to God. Now, we often hear talk about religion. Uh, coming from the UK with Northern Ireland and all those things going on, we often hear stories of people saying, Religion is the leading cause of war. Religion is man's attempt to reach God. But the reality for us is that we waste our time because God has already reached out to man, coming in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, God with flesh. Now we all of us have a hole inside, don't we? Now some try and fill it with money, some with their possessions, alcohol, sex, drugs, status, power and position. All so that we feel accepted, all so that we feel good about who we are as a person. God loves us where we are at, but it's also said that he loves us too much to leave us there. Thus, Jesus comes to reveal the goodness and love of God for mankind, demonstrating that love in tangible, practical, measurable, ways. Knowledge, wealth and power are not, in, not bad in and of themselves, but they cannot be our gods. There is only one God and he can only be reached one way, through a relationship with his son, Jesus. It's the only way to God. So how can you, how can I demonstrate that Jesus is the way to those around us. Something to ponder. I am the truth. We live in a world at a time where anyone can have a platform to share whatever they believe with vast numbers of people. Social media is a two-edged sword. It allows us to share great stuff, but it also allows us to share stuff that's not so great, let's be honest. The amount of contrary information that flies around can be absolutely mind-boggling. 
Not all information we are given is true. Do you wear a face mask? Do you not wear a face mask? Is COVID real? Is it a hoax? There are all kinds of theories going around about coronavirus at the moment. How can we know the truth? Well, in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, Jesus only said and did what he saw and heard the Father say and do. We can't see Jesus, but we can know him. We can know him through the scriptures. You know, at this time where church is scattered to the four winds, where we're not meeting corporately, it's too easy for us to take our foot off the gas and say, oh, it's convenient, it's, uh, it's more comfortable, it's more, be more complacent. We cannot allow those things to creep into our thinking. Now more than ever, we have to be anchored in the scriptures because we don't have that ready access to that body around us, to the teaching from the front that allows us to be anchored in truth. So now more than ever, we've got to be firmly into the scriptures. We've got to be searching for God's wisdom in them and the true guidance that ensures we stay on the pathway. Truth is not a thing, it's a person. It's the person of Jesus. We also know the truth because we haven't been left alone. He's given the Holy Spirit that lives inside every believer, dwelling in us, pointing us to the Lord. The Holy Spirit gives us peace and he can lift that peace when we're beginning to stray from the truth. We should also seek the guidance and counsel of those trusted fellow believers that are in our lives, faith-filled believers. Allow them the necessary latitude to speak into our lives when they see something in us that says that we're pursuing something that's not truth. How can we ensure that what we believe is true is actually truth? Something else for us to ponder. I am the life. As a believer, I believe. I believe that I was created, designed to specific, minute detail, crafted through the will and desire of a loving Father. Not for one second do I believe that I was a product of evolution. You see, I sit here today, I am created for a purpose. And that purpose has an outworking for me and for the world in the world where I am. A perfect plan that's tailor-made for me. There's a perfect plan that's tailor-made for you too. The same goes for every believer. Even those who are not believers, there's a perfect plan and a pathway to outwork that plan for the world. They just don't know it yet. We're not here by accident. We have been given the gift of life by our Heavenly Father. John chapter 1 tells us that God created everything through Jesus, the Word of God, that the Word gave life to everything. But we're not just created for this life. God has an eternal plan for us. In our chapter today, our scripture today, John 14 verses two and three, it tells us that Jesus is right now, in this moment, preparing a place for us, a dwelling place in his Father's house. Jesus does not just give us this temporal life here on earth. He offers everlasting life to all who believe. 1 John 5 verses 11 and 12 say, And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. Unequivocal again. So what is the purpose and call that God has carefully and lovingly placed upon your life. Something else for you to ponder. 
And finally, no one comes to the Father except through me. This really is the bottom line of today's scripture. If we don't have Jesus, we don't have the Father, or the way, or the truth, or the life. I wonder, do you need to commit your life to Jesus today? If so, then what's stopping you? On our chat bar, there'll be a little prompt that comes up that will, you know, I want to commit my life to Jesus today. If you press that button and then press for prayer, someone will be with you and will pray and lead you in a prayer that allows you to commit your life to Jesus. It is the best, the most important decision that you will ever make in your life. Do you know someone who needs to hear the words of life? Then what's stopping you? The gospel presented in love is irresistible. People need the gospel. We don't present it out of judgment or condemnation. We present it in love, believing that we too needed to, pray, to receive it in a place of love. Let me encourage you today. You do not need to feel overwhelmed. When you know the way, the truth and the life, then you have everything that you need to take that step of faith, to share what you have with those people of peace that God has already placed in your world. They're ready, they're waiting for what it is that God has given you to bring. The harvest is ready. Are you willing to go and be part of the laborers who reap the harvest? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through you. Lord, today we commit, we recommit ourselves to you, to that vision, to that calling. Father, that we might be the instruments for your outworking here on this earth. Lord, that we would anchor ourselves so deeply in the scriptures that we would know the truth, and that truth sets us free. Lord, that we wouldn't just be carriers of that truth, but we would be spreaders of it too, Father. That we would share the truth with those that you've placed in our world, that we'd share it with people who are around us that are waiting to hear the good news of the gospel. We thank you for every person listening. We thank you for all those people that you are prompting right now to be willing to share. And we thank you and bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you.
Thank you, Dave, for that powerful message, and thank you to the Musos for the beautiful time of worship today. What a what a great start to the week! Absolutely, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Well, as we do go into this week, uh, we want to encourage you to uh, let Jesus and who He is continue to shape the way that you mm. live. That's the point of this series. This Jesus is series is to reacquaint us with who Jesus is and how it is that we should live in light of that. And so, as we've been reminded today, He is the way. He is the truth. Ultimately, he is the life. And uh, the Christian faith is not about inviting Jesus to join us in our life. Uh, it's about Jesus inviting us to join in his life. And so this week, uh, allow him to show you the way, reveal truth to you, but most importantly, allow you to experience his life in all its fullness. God bless. We look forward to seeing you again. Bye.